one of the things they're saying is that well, these kids they don't really know what the real issues are. They don't know what the you know complexity of the matter is. Well, first of all, this country went to war against Iraq, and I am sure that no American understood why we went to Iraq. No American knew anything about Iraq. And no American could even say what Iraq did to deserve what happened to it. So we know a lot more than what they were reporting uh, and, 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 and handing out uh, and pushing uh, on, on us in both 1991 and 2003. So uh, we know a lot more than they give us credit for. Um, and as, as, uh, as it was introduced, I'm here to talk a little bit about, you know, what is that context? How did we get to where we are today in the modern Middle East? And you have to go back, and maybe some of you have taken classes, but this is going to be the, the quick notes as, they, as I used to have when I went to college. Hopefully it'll uh, give you the, 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 the brief overview in about 20 minutes. Yes, it is. I'm Salam al Mariati uh, with the Muslim Public Affairs Council. And I, I happen to be, I was born in Baghdad, Iraq. Thank you. Thank you. I was born in Baghdad, Iraq, and my, my family fled persecution, actually fled uh, something that they even said. Uh, it was a military coup in 1963, and those that came in in the coup said, we came to Baghdad on our way from Washington. So everybody in Iraq believes that what happens in Baghdad has nothing to do with what the people want. It's not about their sentiment or their, their decisions. It's about what's decided in Washington. And obviously, this has been going on for over 100 years, and that's where we're going to start. So after World War I, you know, uh, the, the British and, and French and even Russian colonialists had decided on a plan called Sykes-Pico. And in Sykes-Pico, it's called the Sykes-Pico Agreement of 1917. And the most important thing to understand from Sykes-Pico, because they, you know, they divided the Middle East into arbitrary lines of borders, and you see that today. But there were three countries that were produced from Sykes-Pico that are important for us today. That did not exist before 1917, or there was not an effort to create it until after 1917. Those three countries are Saudi Arabia, what's called Transjordan, and Israel. Before, it was called the Arabian Peninsula. There was no such thing as Saudi Arabia. And if you follow uh, current events, you see that Saudi Arabia has just recently celebrated its 100th anniversary of its birth. And Transjordan was not Transjordan. There was no such thing as Jordan at the time. There may have been Jordanian people, but they created a border and called it Transjordan. And of course, Israel at that time was called Palestine. And they say, well, Palestine never existed. But when you look to all the documents, everything that was mentioning how we're going to change the configuration of the Middle East said, this is going to be the colonial project in Palestine. So Sykes is the British foreign desk officer. And Pico is obviously the, the French foreign desk officer. And they had agreed to have this configuration uh, split up. And so in Mecca, which is considered the holy land, the holy site for Muslims, where the Kaaba is, where the Hajj takes place, there was the, the, the family, the Hussein family. They were the ones in charge of Mecca at that time. The British decided to move them. And they basically said, we're going to move you, and we're going to empower with money and arms the Saud family. So there was an agreement between the Saud family and the British that they would control the Arabian Peninsula. And of course, we all understand that there was this broken promise or false promise that the Arabs were going to get freedom and independence at the time. Because at that time, the Ottomans were in control, and the British and the French said, if you fight with us against the Ottomans, then you will get your independence. And of course, none of that happened. Instead, we had dictators, uh, basically a mafia that has been running the Middle East ever since then. So the Sauds took over the Arabian Peninsula. The Hussein family uh, was moved 
and one member was given Jordan, <clears throat> and he became the king of Jordan, and then another member was given Iraq, and he was considered the king of Iraq at that time, and so on and so forth. So that is basically, in a nutshell, is how that configuration happened. The British decided to give families power over certain countries. The one land that the British would not give up was Palestine. They decided to occupy Palestine themselves and not promise it to anyone, other than what we know now is the Belfort Decora Declaration that said, you Jews who are being persecuted in Europe are gonna move you to Palestine and you can create your own country there. But the British intent at that time is that they would maintain 100% control of Palestine. Why is that? It's because obviously Palestine represented a strategic location for these empires, number one. Number two, it had Jerusalem as another holy site. So whoever controlled the holy sites of Mecca and Jerusalem controlled the whole religious landscape of the area. Before that happened, by the way, just a little digression, the Muslims had ruled Jerusalem and Palestine for over 1,300 years. And throughout that time, there, were all, there was always a Jewish presence in Palestine. There was always access to worshiping the Jewish temple. There was always a Christian presence in Palestine and Jerusalem because the Muslims believed that we are part of the Abrahamic faiths and Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. This idea that the land only belonged to the descendants of Isaac is a lie. It was given to all the descendants of Abraham, including those who were the descendants of Ishmael. And these are the Muslim and Arab people that we find today. And by the way, they are Arab Jews, some, uh, uh, Sephardic Jews, Arab Christians, and Arab Muslims. So this dividing up as, as if it, that God is a realtor and he promised this land to one specific group is a falsehood that they use to justify their narrative. And the problem with the narrative is that we are imposed by that narrative. And I'll give you an example. When we go through high school, when I went through high school, we had Greek civilization, Roman civilization, and then they called it the Dark Ages. Those Dark Ages was the peak of Islamic civilization. And I go to high schools now and I ask them, you know, when you use math, when you, when you, when you use the number, numbering system in math, what is it called? It's called the Arabic numerals. Why? Because it was the Muslims who developed algebra and algorithms and chemistry and geometry and everything. That is blotted out from our history books. And it is done for the purpose of erasing all of that civilization. Just like they're erasing Palestinian Christians of ever having a presence there. Or erasing uh, Jewish presence in that area throughout that time. That is the erasure that they use in their narrative, and we have to now pre uh, present our narrative on this issue. So that is why they considered Palestine important and kept it to themselves until, of course, 1948, when the, the country, the nation of Israel was created, and so on and so forth. And even Harry Truman said, well, the Jews, they wanted to wipe out all the Arabs and push them into the sea, and the Arabs didn't want that, and I had to make a compromise between the Arabs and the Jews. And you, you see that in, in, in reading the history. And obviously there was ethnic cleansing, there was the Nakba, and so on and so forth. Fast forward to 1952, another important country. 1952, there was a democratically elected leader in Iran named Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh was a secular democratic leader. He was elected by the people. The British did not want Mossadegh as the leader because he wanted the profits of the oil fields to go to the Iranian people. British Petroleum, I forgot what it was called at that time, it was later called British Petroleum, said, no, we have the technology, we developed it, it's our profit. So obviously there was a fight and they presented Mossadegh as being against the people. They tried to bring the Shah back once, it did not work. The second time, the manip they manipulated the mob, and that's important for us because they will try to create saboteurs amongst us, 
and try to instigate, instigate us to do things that are not part of our agenda, so we should always be clear about what our agenda, but they instigated the mob to basically kick Mossadegh out and bring the Shah back in. And from that point on, there was this, uh, and this was done obviously not by the British, because they tried, uh, I believe they tried uh, uh, with the uh, FDR, it did not work. Uh, they tried with uh, Truman, it did not work. And then finally when Eisenhower came in, he had two guys work for him. Both were named Dulles. That's the, it's na they are named after our airport. One was head of the CIA, one was head of the State Department, and they're the ones who led the coup in Iran. And there the Shah was imposed on Iran, and we have what we see today in terms of the revolution in 1979 and all the tensions that come from that, and it is a threat. The last thing I want to say about history is that Egypt, after 1967, was basically destroyed. After that, Iraq was destroyed. And I was in, uh, coming out of college and working for the Muslim Public Affairs Council in 1991, and I remember what James Baker, the Secretary of State, said. He said, we need to go to war in Iraq because it is for our way of life. Our way of life that we have to hoard all the resources of the world against the will of the people of those countries. To the point that we killed now, we killed the United States. We, the American people, have blood on our hands, not only in Palestine, but in Iraq and in so many other parts of the world where we killed about 800,000 children under the age of five in Iraq. And millions more that we are not even aware of because it is not reported to us in 1991 and in 2003. So that was destroyed. And next is Iran. Now, I'm not a fan. I was never a fan of Saddam Hussein. I'm not a fan of the mullahs. I'm not a fan of anyone in that region, for that matter. I don't think they represent Islam. I don't think they represent the people. But I also know that every time it is used as a license for war, the situation only gets worse. More people suffer, more people are displaced, the country is destroyed, and we have to work to re, uh, uh, reconstruct these, these countries, and it will take decades to do that. And so next is Iran. And then after Iran, Pakistan, or Indonesia, whatever, Turkey, they will choose some other country to continue, to, to continue this. So the geopolitics that was based on what happened in 1917, that's the policy that the United States is following to this day. It is an archaic policy. It is a counterproductive policy. It is an unjust policy. It is a ruthless policy. And that is what has to be changed. And unfortunately, that's the national security policy of today. So when they say we have, we're doing this in the name of national security, that is what, they're, what they mean. Just like they said, we had to intern Japanese American for what? For the purpose of national security. And we have to round up Arabs after 9-11, even though they're not from Saudi Arabia or Egypt, where most of these hijackers came from. Why? For the purpose of national security. And we had to bomb Afghanistan and Iraq and so on and so forth. They all use this term national security to basically paralyze people and in the courts, when the executive branch invokes national security, the court says, well, that is the purview of the executive branch. We have no way to really tell them what to do in terms of foreign policy. That is what needs to change. And only when the American people understand this problem will they then say, we have to change the system. We can't let national security be that license for the executive branch so that any president comes in and says, I have to do this, and then we all just wait and see what, how, how to pick up the pieces after that. So national security policy is important for us to debate and to change. And I say, forget about national security policy. We need human security. Human security is not looking to the geopolitics of the region to make sure that Israel has the military advantage, and Saudi Arabia has the advantage, and Jordan is going to be protected, and so on and so forth. In other words, just these leaders have to stay in power, who have been in power for now almost 100 years. But the rights of the people need to be part of the security. 
the rights of the people and freedom of worship and freedom of expression and freedom from fear and freedom from want. That should be our policy towards the future. And that is the only way that we're going to fight this is by having that alternative in my opinion. The last thing I want to say is that this led now to what we call Islamophobia. When we talk about Islamophobia and institutional Islamophobia, because you know the White House is trying to say, we're going to come and help you fight Islamophobia. And we say, unless this includes anti-Palestinian, anti-Arab, and anti-protesters, and anti-student persecution, we don't want to have anything to do with your policy. We will not accept that as the plan to fight Islamophobia. Because Islamophobia is actually now embedded and it is now fueling and it is institutionalized in our national security policy. And I'll give you some examples. When I go to the airport, and it's happened to me, my wife and I were coming back from a, a trip. We had our three children, 10, eight, and two. They took us off the plane and they had a military export into a detention room. And they interrogated us. What, is it, what was the problem? We support Palestinian charities. And again, this was after 9-11. Did Palestine have anything to do with 9-11? No. But the racism and the stereotyping that they fueled to support that led to the suppression and the freezing and the stealing of charitable money from our community by the United States government, and they gave it to some other people. So that is Islamophobia. And so when I get stopped at airports, or when a bank account is frozen, or when people are treated as suspects, as a suspect community, that is because of a 100-year policy that leads to what they call national security that is now amounting to nothing more than Islamophobia. And that is what we have to fight. We're not fighting this as religious figures. It's not a theological conflict. It's not even a political conflict. It is a conflict within America. Either you continue this path of war and genocide and destruction that creates more hate on us as Americans, or you say enough and you promote peace and understanding and say dismantle this policy that is embedded and, and has the underpinning of Islamophobia as the policy of this country. That is what we have to do. That is what we have to be thinking about in terms of strategy, in addition to the divestments and boycott and sanctions as part of our movement, we have to think about how we want the reconfiguration of our policy and therefore the whole region to be represented by the people of the region, not somebody in Washington or in London or in Paris to tell us how we're civilized, how to be civilized. They asked Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? His answer was, that would be a good idea. This is not civilized behavior, whatever they call it, this class of civilizations that they, they claim. And it is, again, it is based on lies, falsehoods, myths. And we are more educated than that. They are not just insulting us in terms of the policy. They're insulting our intelligence. And so let us be more armed and equip people with this information so that we can continue this movement and have it spread and grow. Thank you so, so much. I'm really proud to be here again. So yes, I have time. Yeah, I, I left time for questions. I spoke, what, about 20 minutes? All right, I'm happy. I'm happy to take questions. The first question is always the toughest to start with, so we'll start with the second question. Right? Can you talk a little more about like strategic importance of Palestine and Palestinians and Palestine? Uh, strategic importance of Palestine. So I'll start first from a religious, like as a Muslim. Why is Palestine important to us as Muslims? There's a story in the Quran, some of you may have read it. It's called Isra and Miraj. It's when the story is the Prophet journeyed from Mecca to, Medi to Jerusalem, from the 
sanctuary in Mecca to what's called Al-Aqsa. Aqsa simply means the furthest. So he went from the mosque in Me Me Mecca to the furthest mosque in Jerusalem. And by the way, Jerusalem was the first direction of prayer for Muslims. So in his time, the prophet prayed towards Jerusalem. And then later on, the Quran says, okay, now start praying towards Mecca. Um, and so that's the significance of Jerusalem there. And then from that story, he went to Jerusalem and he ascended with all the other prophets and prayed with them. Why is that significant for us, even if we are not Muslim? What that meant for Muslims is that all these prophets are one. If you believe in the unity of God, you have to believe in the unity of the prophets. The Quran says, we make no distinction among them. So if you have a people who follow Moses or follow Jesus or follow Isaac or follow Noah, whatever, whatever they follow, it is our obligation as Muslims to consider them a protected group. They are part of our Abrahamic family. As I said, Abraham had two sons, Isaac and Ishmael. And so the, from that is the Abrahamic family. And so we were there. We, we believe that the prophet was sent to codify this Abrahamic understanding and protect all the religions in Jerusalem and Palestine. So Palestine was the land of the prophets or is the land of the prophets for us. And this is where we are mandated to protect all religion. There's no one religion that can monopolize God. God is too big to have just one of these religions say, that's it, and everybody else is the wrong religion. So whether, and, it, and the Quran says, for the Jews who follow the Torah and the Christians who follow the gospel, anyone who believes in God in the last day, they will be rewarded and they will have nothing to grieve. So that understanding was part of the construct and what led to Omar, who went to Jerusalem when the Romans were defeated, and then he took over uh, as the ruler, but he also said, we will make an agreement with the Christians that we will not take away their crosses, we will not do away with their churches, and on top of that, we will bring the Jews back, whoever, uh, that was, uh, whoever was, was, was kicked out under the Romans, we will bring some Jewish families back to preserve this idea of a united Jerusalem under all the religions. That is the Islamic narrative. And that is what is important for us as Muslims. And so in addition to the strategic location of Palestine, because it is the best property, because it is right there along that, uh, the, the coastline of the Mediterranean, uh, and it connects the what's called Balad al-Sham, that greater part of Syria and, and Lebanon and Palestine and, part, and, and that area, with Egypt, with, North, with, the, uh, with Africa. So it is also a strategic location uh, for them, and obviously it had resources. Uh, there were people that developed agriculture, obviously, that developed so many things in Palestine. And so the destruction of Palestine meant the destruction of everything that we believed in and everything that was strategic to the, to the whole region. And if you control Palestine, you control the rest of the region. And that is the significance of Palestine. Any other questions? Yeah. So on, on the issue of using human shields, first of all, it's already been documented that Israel uses Palestinians as human shields, right? Um, and whether, you know, Hamas, what we have said is, you are making all these charges, right? You know the best way to, to finally get to the bottom of this, what we did in Bosnia. We allowed a war crimes tribunal. So br bring in the, the war crimes tribunal and have them investigate everything. Anybody that committed any war crime, be it on the side of the Palestinians or on the side of Israel, let them you know, face the, the court, the International Court of Justice. And the problem is obviously, the Israelis don't want to have anything to do with it because they don't want anyone to report what's happening. They killed journalists, they killed humanitarian workers, and they, and they uh, eliminated UNRWA, so they don't want to have it. But if anybody is being used as a, as a human shield, or if there was any sexual violence or anything like that, let the war crimes tribunal come and give us a report, and we will accept it. You know, the Quran says, stand up for truth and be witnesses to God, even if you have to testify against yourself or your family or your community. And, and that has always been the Islamic principle.
Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. The way I see it is, I don't see, uh, you know, I've been doing this for 45 years. Uh, and obviously, we, we haven't gotten that far in 45 years. But this is a multi generational mission. Again, if we, you know, the, the Islamic lessons is there were prophets at different stages, at different civilizations, at different times. Nobody completed the mission during his lifetime. And so we should not think that we're going to get a war crimes tribunal tomorrow. But we have to keep, we have to, if we can say it, then we say it. If we can do it, then let's do it. But if we can't do it yet, we don't have the, uh, the um, you know, I, I think the, the sentiment, the public opinion is shifting and people are more aware. So I hope that all of us can be able now to go and teach others and let this movement grow. And the more people will be aware, they will demand it. And either we change the policy or we change the leadership of this country or we do both. Uh, and then people will say, you know, when we, when we read the Constitution, what does it say? We, the people, in order to form a perfect union, establish justice. That's the one word that's not mentioned in the Congress these days. Well, we need a, a movement to bring that word justice back to our nomenclature, to our political culture, and demand that a war crimes tribunal take place. But if it, all we can do is say, and say that this is what is right, then we say it. And we, let, we, 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 we see where we can move the needle uh, elsewhere. But our, our job is to really uh, crystallize the model for justice and then hand it over to future leaders and then they can take it from them. Um, you know, I, I always believe that, you know, we had, that there was an election, I think in 2006 or around then, I think the Palestinians have the right to determine their own leaders. And they're the ones who decide the leadership, not Israel, not the United States but it's the Palestinian people who should determine who their leaders are, and we should just be promoting that. One state, two state, I don't know. Again, that's up for the Palestinians to, uh, to decide, but we believe in what? Freedom, justice, and equality. And if secular democracy works for us here, why can't secular democracy work for people there, right? Why can't we give them a secular democracy and then let them decide how to deal with this politically? But we, we believe in separation of church and state until and unless we talk about Israel. We believe in international law and accountability until and unless we talk about Israel. We believe in, in free speech and the right to <clears throat> protest our own government unless and until we talk about the Israeli government. So that has to change in, in order for us to see the Palestinian people get their will and their self-determination. Yeah, so, you know, it's an interesting question. The question is, what about countries like Spain and, and South Africa in terms of international uh, humanitarian law, international court of justice? You know, what's really interesting is it just underscores the point that none of the Arab countries was able to do anything for the Palestinians. And to me, South Africa represents more uh, of the true sentiment of the, of the Arab and Muslim peoples than these Muslim and Arab countries do uh, all together. Um, so uh, we honored the, the foreign minister of South Africa at the South African embassy in, in Washington. And we were invited to South Africa to continue working. The one thing you have to understand, the Congress is trying to punish South Africa. There is a bill in the Congress, I forgot what the number is, but we can get it to you, that would say that because uh, uh, the South African government is pro-Palestinian, they might be sympathetic to terrorism, therefore they are going to be disqualified from in a certain commerce, certain trade measures uh, between them and other countries, and they, will, they could lose up to $21 billion. So we need to fight that and support South Africa uh, and support any country that is, is working to bring uh, uh, international law uh, back uh, and international humanitarian law as, as the basis for relations between countries. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, and I hope, hope we can continue this at, at a future date. And, and again, I'm very proud to be here, proud to be with you, and uh, I pray for your success.
Thank you. And your, and your protection. And if there's anything we could do at the Muslim Public Affairs Council, please let us know. All right. Thank you.